families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Families Divided TV. We are really happy you're with us tonight, and we also want to tell you, if you've never subscribed to our YouTube channel, just click that button that says subscribe, and um, you'll be part of what we do. And if you want to receive the notifications, click the little bell and you'll receive notifications when we put new material out, which is on a regular basis. Thanks much for being a part of us. We want to help as many people as we can going through this hell on earth called alienation. Also, the professionals who work in the field. And this episode tonight, we're going to have Dr. Kelly Baker with us. It's her first time and we're pleased, have, pleased much to have her with us. Dr. Baker is going to discuss a model for treatment management in cases involving contact refusal. The model can be applied to mild, moderate, and severe cases of contact refusal after the assessment has been completed. Dr. Baker has used this model of intervention in many of her cases where children resist contact with one of their parents during separation and divorce. The approach evolved around uh, her work as, that she did as guardian at Lynham, managing several cases of parental alienation after the court ordered a no contact period for the alienating parents. However, the team model has been supported and discussed by several scholars in the field as one way to work with these very complex and high needs families. Dr. Baker will explain the things she has learned about the treatment team lead role in terms of one, the skills and knowledge needed to fulfill the role, two, duties inherent in the role, and three, important things to include in the court order. This is a great episode. You may want to take notes, so get pen and paper. We're going to be right back with Dr. Kelly Baker right after these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to talk about an approach, um, some processes for working with uh, families when there are parent-child contact problems. My name is Kelly Baker, and um, I look forward to sharing some ideas with you today. We are going to talk about four different topics. We'll start with a little bit of history and background about how um, my approach to working with these families uh, evolved over the years and also some contributions from uh, social science uh, researchers and cl clinicians. And then we'll talk about what the treatment team actually looks like. And then I want to focus some on the treatment team lead person, the skills that they need, the experience that they need to have, and uh, the knowledge and training that they should have. I'll finish up with a discussion about containment, which is one of the ways uh, that I think this process helps lead to uh, more success than traditional methods of therapy. 
So a little bit of history about um, about me and the evolution of this, my approach is that I started uh, taking guardian ad litem appointments around 2005. When I did that, I began uh, uh, doing, um, I'm sorry, assessments for families who were experiencing a lot of conflict. That was some of my first um, initial experiences with really high conflict families. I had been working with families in divorce, but I um, did not have the experience with the level of conflict that I uh, got when I began taking guardian appointments. And as I was flailing around and trying to read everything I could on how to help these families, you'll see some of the citations on my PowerPoint of the um, the critical articles that helped me so much. And I did just want to take a little bit of time to uh, say thank you to all the people who did that work um, and wrote about it because there was very little available to me, or at least that's what it felt like. And so much of what I have to offer today is captured in their writings. And this is just a handful that I chose. Um, and there are so many more people involved in this work who have been uh, critical. I just picked a few of the first um, ones and the more recent ones that I've read lately. So some of the things that all of these uh, writings had in common and things that I learned were the importance of specific court orders and the importance of a team approach and different ideas about how to put a team together. I also learned a lot about assessment and Karen Woodall used to have a phrase called assessment informs intervention that has always been so important for, for my work and I continue to be amazed at how as I recommend certain interventions, I gain more and more knowledge about the capacity and willingness of the family members to change. And in that um, increased awareness, I may need to change my intervention plan a bit. And so that's where the idea of flexibility comes in. And uh, several of the people who have written about working in treatment teams will talk about needing to maintain some flexibility um, to change your intervention to match uh, your increased knowledge about the family. They also talk about the importance of oversight and accountability and case management. And so the importance of maybe one person on the team having some authority to communicate directly with the court and to also make decisions for the team. They mentioned the absolute necessity of an assessment. And I will say that this is one of the areas where I see uh, traditional therapy and therapists who approach families in high conflict from a traditional therapeutic perspective really failing. And some of the recent writings, the Polak article that I had on my first frame and also Amy Baker and her associates did a recent paper in 2020 about the importance of assessment and how little assessment is actually being done before the interventions, the therapeutic interventions are applied. Um, and also the importance of therapists to understand specific goals for each of the family members and how those goals might be different than uh, goals they would have in a traditional therapeutic setting. So let's look at the model. We start with the court, or this could be two lawyers discussing the fact that uh, their clients have very different views about where the problems are coming from. And they want to ask someone to give them information about what's going on in the family and what's causing the child's resistance to one parent. Or it could be that you do start in court with a temporary orders hearing um, and there are problems that are beginning to surface and the court says, I need a deeper investigation of this. So at this point, whether it's lawyers or the court, someone is appointed. 
I call this person a treatment team lead because statutes vary from state to state to state in terms of who this person or what this person would actually be called. In my state, it's going to most likely be a guardian ad litem. Many guardians here in Texas are mental health professionals who have backgrounds working with high conflict families. And um, so they are the natural choice for this role. After the treatment team is appointed, there is probably a in-depth assessment done, especially whenever this person is appointed early in the process, either by the lawyers or the court. However, if it's the case that there has already been a full evidentiary hearing and the court has made a finding of alienation and they've also implemented a no contact order and they want a therapeutic intervention to be um, for the family to undergo that, they may at that point after the finding of alienation, appoint this person. I've also done that in the role of a case manager um, or in the role of a guardian. And in that instance, there's not an assessment that needs to be done because the court has already made the finding, but there is an intervention that needs to be set up. And so the team lead would choose a family therapist that they know has the specialized knowledge to work with the targeted parent and the child or the children. They would choose then a different therapist to work with the alienating parent. The hope is eventually that the alienating parent can gain enough knowledge about their own contributions to the problem that they could begin doing family therapy with the targeted parent and the children. But initially, they have a certain amount of education uh, and self-awareness that needs to occur before they're ready to work with the family therapist. If, the, if there was the need for a psych evaluation in order to inform that therapy with the alienating parent, the team lead could recommend someone to do the psych evaluation evaluation if the court has not already ordered that. So when there are red flags about personality disorders uh, or a delusional disorder, there may need to be a psych evaluation done first before the therapy with the alienating parent can really address what's going on at a deeper level. The team lead may decide uh, to appoint some other therapist in the process. So again, this is this idea of flexibility where you work, uh, you get the, get the family doing a certain amount of work. You, you may gain information that you need some other help also. I like to start with just a family therapist and then a therapist for the alienating parent because the smaller team is easier to manage and easier to keep united. But I don't ever hesitate to appoint an individual therapist for a child or a parenting coach for the targeted parent who seems to be struggling um, with regaining their parental authority and uh, working uh, at home with the child. I also sometimes think a co parenting coach uh, begins to. Uh, work with the targeted parent and the alienating parent on ways to develop maybe a parallel parenting plan, although that usually does not happen right away. But those are these are just some ideas of other people that may need to come on board and the treatment team lead would make that decision and also choose those people. So let's talk a little bit about the parameters of the treatment team. Uh, lead role and how those need to be defined in order to keep the process with the family organized and somewhat systematic. So the treatment team lead is not a therapeutic role and it is a court appointed role. So finding again the appropriate statute in your state family code um, is what each person needs to do in different states. Again, in Texas, it's usually a guardian or a case manager appointment. And if 
you haven't gone to court and the lawyers agree on this appointment, it still needs to be captured in formal legal agreements. While it's not therapeutic, it probably will be a licensed professional because it's been my experience that if the treatment team lead knows the processes that should be occurring in the family therapy and in the individual therapy, they're more likely to make sure that the treatment goals of the individual therapist and the family therapist are all aligned. Um, they need to have the authority to select the team members. So again, there's a focus on very specialized mental health professionals being appointed to the team or being chosen for the team. And those uh, mental health professionals have very specialized knowledge about working with these types of issues. The team lead needs the authority to to inform the court about non-compliance. They also need the authority to make continued therapeutic recommendations. As I was explaining earlier, this need, this, this need to be able to adjust things as your understanding of the people and the dynamics becomes clearer is, is usually an important um, piece of an intervention plan to keep a family moving forward. The authority to make recommendations for incremental changes to the parenting time schedule may or may not be a necessity. If, if the treatment team lead role is appointed early on in the process and the children are adhering to the parenting time schedule, but there is something else um, going on that the, the judge had concerns about or that the lawyers had concerns about, then it there may not need to be an authority to make parenting time changes. That only comes into play whenever the court has issued, let's say, a step-up plan in custody time, or let's say they have issued a 90-day no contact, and uh, eventually wants the alienating parent to be reintegrated into some normal parenting time. Those are examples of when the authority to make those parenting time changes uh, would need to be part of the ordered um, role of the treatment team lead. Not that somebody might not disagree with that, but the authority to make those recommendations needs to be part of the order. And so let's look at the experience training skills that's needed in this kind of critical role of the treatment team lead. So there's a certain amount of family court experience that's going to be necessary. And mental health professionals do not get this in graduate school. Of course, if the person appointed to this role was a lawyer, they would already have this. But some awareness of how to write court recommendations about how to provide testimony in court. Uh, the basics of understanding court orders and terminology and legal language and processes is very important to this role. So this person needs to be comfortable engaging with lawyers and uh, providing testimony in court in order to be uh, to fully uh, function in this role. They also need to have some postgraduate knowledge about therapy with families and divorce. So it is a, a normal course of graduate training that you would get family therapy theories and perhaps techniques, um, and but probably not specific to divorce and separation. So this person needs to have had the motivation to gain their own education and continuing education opportunities to understand the difference between forensic and clinical roles to understand specific dynamics related to children and parents going through separation and divorce. And they also need to understand the guidelines of a court-appointed therapist. 
They need to have also specialized knowledge about working with high conflict families and parent-child contact issues. So some of those topics are co-parenting skills, co-parenting plans, parental alienation, estrangement. What's the difference between estrangement and a loyalty bind? What's the difference between estrangement and parental alienation? How do you know the difference? Also, they need to understand the part that enmeshment and uh, boundary violations and intrusive parenting can play in, uh, in these families and also understand personality disorders and how they impact these families and how they are associated with um, alienation. It's also important for them to have gained knowledge about the dis different forms of domestic violence and the overlap between interpersonal violence, uh, co coercive controlling behaviors, and alienation. All of that information is not captured in graduate programs. In fact, almost none of it is captured in graduate school programs. So when you're looking for a person to fill this role, you might need to ask about their continuing education. For instance, I, I keep a list of all of my continuing education over the years, and I have over 200 hours in continuing education, specifically on alienation, co-parenting, conducting custody evaluations, and that sort of thing. So don't hesitate to ask for a person's uh, continuing education uh, um, list or or ask them what the topics have been about that they've sought continuing education on. And then the last thing that they need to be able to do is the assessment piece. So again, part of what creates a, a very successful intervention plan or, or perhaps um, makes it more likely to be highly successful is a very good assessment. So an in-depth assessment is going to uh, differentiate between the causes for the child's resistance to the parent. Uh, so understanding how bias can interfere in a good assessment of a family, understanding how suggestibility can influence children and the statements that they might make. Understanding how to conduct a psychosocial assessment and also understanding what the five factor model is and what is the value of the five factor model. I think my, many of these things come down to understanding the processes for differentiation, because without understanding how all the dynamics, um, how all the dynamics in the family come together and have created this situation of a child resisting contact with a loved, once loved parent, or perhaps having been exposed to some sort of domestic violence in the family and having some realistic reasons for resisting contact. You, you can't understand that at the level that you need to understand it without an assessment being done. So that is, is usually the first place to start. Um, so when we talk about the value of containment, and it's one, it, this is just my, my, has been my professional experience, that, that containment with these families is so important. And one thing that this type of process does is it makes things very organized and systematic, where there is a point person sort of leading the, the, the ship. Let's say I use that analogy a lot about um, a, a captain uh, cannot have crew members who are all going in different directions and expect their uh, their boat to arrive at the destination of their choice. Right. And so you have to make sure your crew members who are all the mental health professionals all understand what the goal is, which are healthy relationships as much as possible with for the child with both their parents, and then understand how to get there. So containment comes from this process by with the use of binding court orders. 
so the 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 process is is defined and the the team lead is given certain authorities and it's written in a binding agreement uh, and the parties are expected to adhere to it and there are consequences if they do not. The other thing that it offers is the use of specialized mental health professionals. So these again are people who are chosen specifically because of their experience, because of their training, um, and because of their willingness to work with this very high needs population. Um, many of them have worked on teams before and have the experience of working with a mental health team on an intervention, which is very different than uh, a therapist who works in a traditional private practice and is not used to making any collateral calls, is not used to carving out time to speak to lawyers or um, to have a team meeting. So these are specialized professionals. Um, it also provides containment by being very specific about the treatment. So um, these specifics can be contained in the court order, but usually they are in uh, another type of agreement. Uh, Brian Ludmer has an excellent family treatment agreement that um, he is willing to share, and I would recommend getting a copy of it from him. I also have a copy and am happy to, to share it, but it can be adapted um, somewhat to different uh, family situations. But in general, what it does is it requires both the parents to uh, sign the document and state that they are both in agreement that the goals of treatment are um, to repair relation, parent-child relationships, restore parent-child relationships, and get back to a point where the children are enjoying normal parenting time schedules with both the parents. It also makes a statement that therapy will be a priority for a certain amount of time. And then progress will be reevaluated at that point. And so this helps to keep everyone focused on the fact that therapy sessions each week are not optional. And other activities should not be um, put onto the child's schedule that interfere with therapy. And so it's very specific about how many times a week therapy will occur. And again, it makes this very specific statement that the intervention, the therapeutic intervention for the family is the priority for at least X number of months, usually three, four, up to six. Um, the other thing that this process does or what I've seen this process do and how it can be helpful in containing the family and keeping the intervention on track is that it provides a lot of accountability. So when I am appointed in this role and there is an intervention that needs to occur, I usually request that there's going to be a 30-day review hearing set for the next 90 days. So there would be three review hearings set. If we don't need it because everyone's doing what they're supposed to do and progressing well, then we'll just pass the hearing. But if those hearing dates are set, I find this very useful in uh, keeping people on track. If they know that they might need to go in front of the judge in less than 30 days, then they will probably not try to find ways to get out of their therapy appointments or get out of doing the things they've been asked to do. The other thing that I do as a treatment team lead that I think maintains accountability of the family members is I hold a treatment team meeting every 30 days. So usually about a week before I'm going to issue a 30-day, 60-day, or 90-day report to the lawyers and the court, I will hold a treatment team meeting, making sure that everyone is showing up for their sessions and getting an idea about the progress that's been made also hearing about progress that's not being made and 
that way in my 30 day report or my 60 day report, I can request other services that might be needed to address problems that are presenting themselves. In this way, it makes problem solving a much more uh, efficient and effective process. If we're not waiting th three months to get back before the judge to ask for a change, then we see changes made pretty quickly. Uh, so let's look at this in picture form. I'm often reminded of uh, Karen Woodall's term that the court becomes for a while the super parent. And I think that's very accurate. When you look at our families that are in such high dysfunction, they are somewhat chaotic and have lost their authority and their ability to manage the family system in a healthy way. The judge or the court and the court order symbolically provides the structure for them that they can't provide to themselves. Eventually, we hope that they don't need that. But until they stabilize, um, this is what it does. And it is very helpful in keeping a family on track. And when there is a family member that is not going to adhere to intervention, is not going to do what they need to do to change their behavior and to help the children, then there is, like I said, a very quick way uh, to let the court know about that. So um, that's all for me today. This is my contact information, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. And uh, thank you for joining us. In our next episode of Families Divided TV, Aaron Larson speaks to us on the five critical mistakes alienated grandparents unknowingly make online.